From its founding in 1902 to present day, Cadillac has churned out some awesome automobiles, most of which have been focused on luxury. From the 1930s era Cadillac V16s and V12s to the 1967 Eldorado to even the 1992 STS, Cadillac has put out vehicles that not only connote luxury, but also exude style. It was the car that people aspired to own once they had quote-unquote made it in life. And Cadillac enjoyed a high degree of success, particularly in the 1970s, when the division sold into the 400,000 plus units each year. And while many Cadillacs were excellent automobiles, just like any other automobile company, there were some stinkers that Cadillac put out in the marketplace. This video is going to be focused on the top five worst Cadillacs that were introduced to the marketplace. And you're going to see that in some cases, I've selected a specific model year as a worst Cadillac, and in other cases, a more general range. And I'll explain the reason for that as I go along in the list. Let's start with number five, and that is the 1971 to 73 Cadillac lineup, including Cadillac DeVille, Fleetwood, Eldorado, and Calais series vehicles. Now, the listener will point out that I've just mentioned a number of model years for Cadillacs and basically called out the entire lineup for the 1971 to 73 model years. And there's good reason for that. Let me explain. First, let me get out of the way that the 71 to 73 Cadillacs generally have excellent engines and transmissions and rear ends. Very, very durable, 472 cubic inch, 500 cubic inch V8s, although not all that great in horsepower, but certainly very torquey engines. And they were backed by turbohydromatic 400 and 425 transmissions, you know, best of breed, if you will. And they had a very stout rear end. But there are a number of things that make the 71 to 73 Cadillacs just real stinkers in my mind. And the first of which is that the overall fit and finish of these vehicles was absolutely deplorable for the time, as were the materials, particularly on the interior, that were employed. It was during this time that Cadillac was becoming so successful that it was running into capacity challenges for its model lineup. And as a result, the division sped up the line speed in its assembly plants, mostly the Cadillac Clark Street plant in downtown Detroit, to a higher rate of 72 cars per hour. Typical for the time was about 60 cars per hour. So this was 20% above the normal line speed. And the result of that was that the cars were not thrown together with very much care. Often the body fits were extremely poor and actually even more poor or poorer than other GM divisions of the era. So despite Cadillac being the upper end mark, it actually in some cases has the worst fit and finish of any of the marks that General Motors produced during that time period. Unfortunately, Cadillac's woes also extended to the interior on the 1971 to 73 models, and the materials on these vehicles really are subpar. The 71s to 72s, I would say, are the worst of the breed, where the door pull straps are noted for becoming dislodged after owners yanked on them a number of times in order to get the doors to close because the door hinge pins were sagging, thus increasing the door closing effort. The issue became so severe that Cadillac actually issued a technical service bulletin to dealers that stated that they should drill a hole through the escutcheon plate on both sides of the door pull strap and then run a larger screw all the way through that escutcheon through the back of the door panel. You can imagine that this was not a classy looking repair as it left exposed screw heads in the escutcheon plate, but that was what the technical service bulletin said to do. And you can imagine also that if Cadillac felt that that was an adequate solution, well, what their overall tolerance was for quality during this era. The interiors, as I said, on these vehicles were a woeful letdown. In particular, the dashboards, which did have a nice theme that wrapped around the driver, but the instrument panel plastics and indeed the door panels as well, coupled with the sticker that was used to display faux wood grain about the dash as well as the door panels in 1972, and even the faux aluminum sticker for 1971, it just really looked highly unconvincing and cheap. These interiors were so cheap that when you ordered the leather interior on these Cadillacs, you actually got plastic buttons as opposed to leather covered buttons on your seats. In other words, these cars just weren't up to par with what Cadillac had been producing a few model years earlier in the mid and late 1960s. And if I, as an example, had traded in a 1967 Cadillac on a 1971 model, I would have been 
woefully underwhelmed by the 1971 model given these issues. I did select the 1971 to 73 model years because the dashboard was redesigned in 1974 and I think it had a bit more tasteful look, though it did still look cheap. And the door panels were indeed redesigned for 1973 with much larger anchoring points for the pole straps to help alleviate the pole strap issue, but still the interior and the fit and finish issues remain. They did start getting better by, I would say, around the 1974 model year. Let's move on to number four, and that is the 1982 Cadillac Cimarron. Now, notice that I called out a particular model year of the Cadillac Cimarron, its first model year for 1982, and there's a number of reasons for that. Chief among them is that the 1982 Cimarron in particular was a vehicle that was just absolutely hurried into the marketplace, and really the development had to be executed in about six months, which meant the designers were not able to change much of anything aside from the wheels, the grill, and the taillights. In six months' time, you can't change any of the sheet metal, basically, and can only touch some of those softer items or items that are quick to retool and the interior, which Cadillac did for 1982. But the reason why I picked the 1982 model here is that it has the least revisions to the Cavalier upon it, which was based, largely because, as I mentioned, Cadillac was rushing this vehicle to marketplace to placate dealers who were clamoring extremely loudly that they were going to leave the franchise if Cadillac did not provide a small car to them. Cadillac knew that this vehicle wasn't going to be competitive when they were introducing it, but they hoped that it would buy them enough time to make it better and to placate the dealers during this interim period. Unfortunately, however, the strategy didn't really work all that well, and the Cimarron has been a punching bag for quite some time. Now, I will say that after the 1982 model year, the Cimarron actually becomes an increasingly enjoyable vehicle, especially once the V6 was introduced into the vehicle. But for 1982 and 1982 alone, the Cimarron had under hood a 1.8 liter overhead valve, four-cylinder engine that was effectively a parts bin engine using the same valve train and pistons and other items from the Chevrolet 2.8 liter V6. It was so underwhelming in its 88 horsepower that just one year later, General Motors enlarged it to two liters. And the two liter actually wasn't that bad of an engine, especially the two liters with cast iron heads, which I believe were produced up until the 1986 model year. After that, they switched to aluminum heads and then sometimes they had some head gasket issues for them uh, in a number of years. But the 82 Cimarron with that 1.8 liter was just horrendously bad. It took about 16 and a half, 17 seconds to go zero to 60. And for a car that was trying to be a bit sporting, well, you can imagine how sporting that was. As the years went by, the Cimarron actually evolved into, honestly, a fun car. I have a 1986 Cimarron, and I love driving it. It's a V6 automatic, and it's quiet on the inside. It's fun to drive. It's reliable. It's actually a great little fun car. But for 1982, and really because of that 1.8 liter engine and the fact that Cadillac designers just didn't have a chance to implement the vision that they wanted, which, take a look here at what they really wanted in an unconstrained vision for the Cimarron, it would eventually get closer to this in years later, but they just didn't have a chance to execute it for 1982. And that's why the 1982 Cimarron makes this list in the number four spot. Let's move on to number three. Coming in at number three, we have the entire Cadillac model lineup for 1981 when equipped with the V864, or you could also say the Olds Diesel because it was optional for 1981, but the Olds Diesel was optional from 1978 to 1985 in a number of Cadillacs. So we're going to put aside the Olds Diesel for the second and focus on the 1981 Cadillacs with the V864. In 1981, Cadillac introduced a technology that would last just one year. And typical for General Motors, they introduced a technology that wasn't quite ready for prime time. It fails, but then becomes the industry standard years later. And that would be the case with cylinder deactivation, which is very typical on many cars today. And would also be the case with, as an example, the Chevrolet Vega engine that was a sleeveless aluminum block engine that now a number of other companies, mostly high-end German makes, 
employ similar technology in engine building. But neither the Vega engine nor the V864 were great engines for their customers. The concept behind the V864 was that you would take off needing all power from all eight cylinders. Then as you started approaching cruising speed, you could back off to six cylinders and the computer would automatically do that for you. And then it would back off to four cylinders for economy on the freeway when demands were low. The problem was that this setup employed some relatively complex solenoids to activate or deactivate the valve train. You can see here in a picture of the engine, the raised sections under the valve cover where those solenoids were housed. And they themselves had some challenges with reliability. On top of that, the system was a throttle body injected system. So the intake is a wet intake. And you can imagine that if you're activating and deactivating cylinders, well, it's not like a port fuel injection where you're able to shut down the fuel delivery to those cylinders as well. So because it was a throttle body injected setup and didn't have obviously drive-by-wire throttle plates or anything like that, the transition between the eight and six and four cylinder modes was pretty rough. And the six cylinder mode was actually the worst of them. It was an unbalanced mode and the engine shook a little bit. And that's why a lot of the cylinder deactivation for the V8s today just goes from V8 to V4 operation. And beyond the issues that I'm talking about, there were also ECM or electronic control module issues on these vehicles where they would tend to fail. And if you don't believe me, check out Vice Grip Garage as he's working on and posted a video in the last week of him trying to get a 1981 V864 Cadillac running. And well, I won't tell you what the result is. I'll just say go check out his channel. In any event, the V864 was a unquestioned failure. Cadillac had to send letters to its customers extending the warranty and saying that they stood by the product. And in fact, the V864 technology would continue on after 1981, but only in limousines because the engine that was introduced for 1982 in the full-size Cadillacs was, well, one could say perhaps even worse and was introduced in 1981. And we'll come back to that in a minute or two. But for now, let's move on to number two. And that's a vehicle that's more modern in Cadillac history, the Caddy that zigs. Anybody remember that slogan? The Cadillac Catera. The Cadillac Catera was introduced for the 1997 model year and was sunset not that many years later in 2001. It was effectively a rebadged Opel Omega that GM brought stateside. And if there's a common theme here between the Katera and the Cimarron, it's that GM is at least trying to go after import buyers, but not really doing so successfully. Roughly 100,000 of these Kateras were sold between 1997 and 2001, and they just had a number of issues associated with them. The first was that the marketing campaign was absolutely terrible. I don't know who came up with the caddy that zigs, but, well, that really wasn't going to captivate too many buyers to get off their couch and into the showroom. But the car itself was just plagued with tons of issues. The three-liter Ellesmere Port V6 engine that was under hood in these Kateras was actually one of the worst that General Motors produced and maybe even in all of its history. It had an extremely high warranty failure rate, And it made only about 200 horsepower. It was a strange engine with variable length intake runners and a 54 degree bank angle, as opposed to the typical 60 degree bank angle for V6s. And unfortunately, the engine and the powertrain, coupled with the electrical system in this Katera and the poor marketing campaign, really doomed it. It also didn't help that the vehicle wasn't styled really to look like a Cadillac. It didn't have at the time, any typical features that Cadillac had, the vertical taillights or the hood with the so-called prow that comes to a point in the middle. And in general, the Katera just really was not a great car. It did peak in sales in the 1997 model year, its first model year, selling about 25,000 in that particular year. And by 2001, it was selling under 10,000 units and was eventually dropped. So the Katera flopped a bit similar to the Cimarron, but at least the Cimarron was decently reliable after the 1982 model year. The Katera really just never was that reliable. And it's a bit of a shame because they are somewhat fun to drive, though that Ellesmere Port V6 under hood really just is not torquey at all. Let's move on to number one. 
And that is the entire full-size lineup for Cadillac in 1982. The entire full-size lineup for Cadillac in 1982, you say. How can I do that? Well, because for 1982, Cadillac would introduce an all-new aluminum block cast iron head, and yes, I said that right, aluminum block cast iron head engine, the HT high-tech, or some would say hook and toe, 4100 V8. Wah, wah. The HT 4100 was really just an abysmal engine in its first few model years, and it was plagued by a number of issues. Usually what would happen is that the intake gaskets would leak, the car would start overheating, it would blow the head gaskets, and then once you do that and you have antifreeze in the oil, you're chewing up all the internals and, well, bye-bye engine, or at least bye-bye camshaft and lifters and crankshaft, and you're pretty much doing a rebuild on these engines. But that was an unfortunately common occurrence with these engines, maybe in part exacerbated by the fact that they really were never designed to go under hood of these big rear-wheel drive DeVilles and Fleetwoods, or even the similarly heavy Sevilles and Eldorados during this time frame. They were designed to be employed under the hood of what would be announced in 1985, the Cadillac Sea Bodies of DeVille and Fleetwood, but... Cadillac, in trying to improve its fuel economy standards, thought that putting these 130-ish, 135-ish horsepower engines under hood in 4,200-plus pound vehicles was a great idea. Now, in fairness to Cadillac, they may not have had much of a choice, as General Motors was trying to meet increased fuel economy standards during the time, and this 4.1-liter V8 engine did deliver considerably better fuel economy than the 368 cubic inch Cadillac V8 that it replaced. In fact, I have a 1984 Seville with this 4.1 liter V8, and on the freeway, I get about 25 miles per gallon, which is pretty good for a car that's pushing weight in the upper 3,000 pounds. But despite the fuel economy, they really just didn't have much power. And as I said, they had a ton of intake and head gasket issues, as well as water pump issues, and well, just a lot of stuff. GM was trying to use RTV sealant during this time as opposed to gaskets, and the early HT4100s really don't have too many gaskets, like under the valve covers or, in some cases, areas under the intake manifold. And if the sealing surfaces weren't perfectly clean before the RTV was applied, it could lead to leaks. And so these engines were leaky and unreliable, just bad, 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 particularly for the 1982 and I would say also the 1983 model year. In 1982, the engine choices that one could opt for were really not much better. As opposed to the HT4100, one could select the Olds 350 cubic inch diesel, also another unfortunate engine. Although you could select, in some cases, a Buick 4.1 liter V6. This was based off of the 3.8 and what would later become the 3800 engine. And that really was the best selection, if you had to pick an engine of all of them, was the V6 credit option. But that V6 really wasn't a great engine either. It was crude. It w didn't have a balance shaft and a 90-degree V6. And the 3.8 and the 4.1-liter V6, prior to them being distributorless, really had some lower-end oiling issues. And they didn't tend to last nearly as long as the 3800s did a number of years later. So for those reasons, I nominate the 1982 Cadillac lineup as the number one worst Cadillac of all time. Hope you enjoyed this list and series on worst Cadillacs of all time. If you did, be sure to comment and let me know if I forgot one. Put it in the comments section. Thanks again for watching.